Chuck began by talking about a classic 80s movie. Not knowing this, I decided to begin by talking about a classic 90s movie. Warning to whoever is up next, there is a trajectory that we're working on here. The movie that I am going to talk about for a moment is, I imagine, going to surprise many of you as an introduction to a session on anti-Semitism. But go with me. The movie is The Lion King. So let me start off by saying I love this film. I think it is phenomenal. I saw it twice during the opening weekend, which I know was in 1994. The animation, you'll remember, is exquisite. The music is amazing. It's such a touching story. And then I saw it again, and it was completely different. I saw it three weeks later, and it was a completely different movie. So I asked what could have changed in three weeks. So in the summer of 1994, I participated in a program that took me, I was 16 at the time, if anyone wants to do the math to figure out my age, but took me and a lot of other 16-year-olds to spend 10 days in Poland. 50 or 60 Jewish teenagers spending a little over a week in Poland to learn about the rich culture of Jewish life that had existed there prior to the Holocaust and about the devastation that was brought on by the Nazis. We walked the streets that had been the Warsaw Ghetto, learning about the conditions in the ghetto and the heroes who stood out, such as Mordechai Anilevich, who led the uprising. We visited concentration camps. And if you look out on this beautiful field, I hate to say it, but I have said before when I've had the pleasure of being at Veterans Park, it looks very much like what Sobibor looks like today. Sobibor Death Camp is now pretty much a soccer field. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful, but then you need to take a pause and remember what it was and what it was that happened there. There are other concentration camps and death camps that have been restored in Poland uh, to museum-like scenarios, such as Majdanek, which really helps people understand the realities of the Second World War and the atrocities of the era. And to pray at that time, so many years ago, the synagogues were basically abandoned. There's been a rebirth of Jewish life in Poland over maybe the last 15 years, uh, but really there was pretty much nothing for decades in the aftermath of the Holocaust. As a matter of fact, the only way that we were sure that Jewish life had ever existed was, ironically, the cemeteries, the many, many cemeteries and gravestones that existed in the area. And from there, after those 10 days, we went to Israel, carrying with us the experiences from Poland, and they would rise up throughout the country of Israel. But the most unexpected place was in the movie theater in Tel Aviv. So a few of us had decided to see The Lion King because it is probably the greatest movie of the 90s. And why not see it again? And I was really enjoying watching the subtitles. I was not fluent in Hebrew at the time, but familiar enough that you could get a, an occasional chuckle from the subtitles to see how they translated. Uh, Hakuna Matata, by the way, translates as Hakuna Matata. There are other elements that were fun to laugh at. But then there was a subtitle that hit me like a ton of bricks. So you remember the film Simba, the young lion pr prince who had witnessed his father's death and then run away from home because he thought it was his own fault. And he's forced to take a hard look at himself. And while he's staring at his reflection in the water, he sees his father. He looks up and his father appears to him in the sky and says, remember who you are. His vision of his father continues to repeat, remember, remember. And as he does, the subtitle at the bottom of the page is the simple word, Zahor. And the word Zahor, remember, called to me. Zahor was the pervasive theme that came out of the experience in Poland, and it is frequently connected to studies and reflections regarding the Holocaust. Remember, Zahor, remember that our security is fragile. Remember, Zahor, remember that we are people who have known unthinkable terror. Zahor, remember that we have persevered. But the term is not limited to our obligation to remember solely the Holocaust. Jewish tradition invokes the word Zahor, remember, to refer to the Shabbat that comes before the most joyous holiday, the holiday of Purim. The ancient tradition asks us to read from the Torah, from the sacred text, a passage which recalls a surprise attack against the Israelites during their early days in the time of the wilderness, 
a low point in their journey. It might seem tempting to brush it aside or bury a difficult memory, but our tradition demands that we do the opposite. We cannot simply forget an attack on our people. We must remember it. We must seek out opportunities to learn from it. Judaism wisely asks us to remember what we might otherwise choose to forget. On Shabbat Zahor, we sadly recall the fact that the Israelites were exposed to unspeakable hardships. We think of the community who suffered great loss. The Torah tells us that it was those who were marching in the back of the group who were slain by the surprise attack. Those in the back of the group would have been the weakest, the most fragile, the ones who were easiest to attack, and thus makes the attack all the worse, knowing that those who were knowing that though they chose to prey on those who could not defend themselves. The words of war, remember, when it appeared on the screen in the movie theater in Tel Aviv, touched something in me. In a single moment, I felt the inextricable connection between the present and the past. That is an essential piece of what is at the core of being human. We are who we are because we remember. For the Jewish people, there are bitter memories that we must hold in order to fully understand the experiences of our ancestors that shaped our current identity. We remember our suffering at the hands of hatred so that we can act against suffering whenever and wherever we see it. Of course, and thank God, we are not alone in this journey. Our partnership with compassionate individuals of all races and religions is pertinent to our survival. Furthermore, for us to fully realize our religious ethos, we must respond to help our brothers and sisters right here in Michigan and around the world. And so in conclusion, I want to tell the two, two stories of allies and advocates. The first is the story of the cemeteries. You might remember that this past winter, there were several cemeteries, uh, Jewish cemeteries specifically, that were desecrated in St. Louis, Missouri, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I imagine that those were, uh, there are others. Those are the two that come to my mind. The one in Missouri, in St. Louis, is particularly interesting because of the partnership with the Muslim community in the area who came together to help to raise the funds and do the physical labor to fix the cemetery, to take something that was desecrated and to fix it. It wasn't necessarily their responsibility. They didn't have, the, the Muslim community didn't have individuals buried in that cemetery. But the recognition that destruction of any religion in our American society calls upon all citizens to take a step forward and to help to make a difference and to make a change speaks to the idea of the allies and advocates that we partner with in Ann Arbor and throughout the country. So many times we think about different groups as being separate, not loving one another, having issue with one another, and in some cases those issues are real. But when it comes down to our basic humanity, we can find a common bond and know that any of us who have had the experience of having our communities destroyed can come together to help bring fix a fix for the future. The other story I want to share is something that happened in New York City, where I spent half of my adult life in New York City, approximately the other half here in Ann Arbor so far. And in New York City, rode the subway more times than you could count on a daily basis. I don't know if you're familiar with this story, but it's the one that's given me the most hope over the course of this last pretty terrible year. It happened that throughout a subway car in New York City, uh, there was anti-Semitic graffiti. Now, I will tell you, in 10 years of living in New York City, I don't ever remember seeing any hateful graffiti in the subway. Now, part of it might have been my own naivete. It's very possible that there were symbols or comments that were there that I did not recognize, that I did not know. I surely would have recognized anti-Semitic uh, graffiti and it just was not occurring at that time. Now, of course, these things are on the rise. So there was someone sitting in the subway car who just, who just couldn't look at it. It was a swastika. I'll tell you the truth. I was planning on bringing a picture of a swastika to do a, an example of, of what happened on the subway, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I just sat there, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. The symbol is too painful to me, and I know that no matter who we are or where we come from, we have symbols that bring that kind of feeling to us that are so painful to look at. So apparently there were swastikas throughout the, um, throughout the subway car. 
and one person uh, remembered that the best way to remove indelible ink is with alcohol and that the, the hand sanitizer that all New Yorkers carry, because let's face it, their hands get very dirty very quickly on that subway car, hand sanitizer contains enough alcohol to remove some of the graffiti. So first, people on the subway car started removing, one person started, took out Purell and started removing, and then the guy next to him was said, wow, I have to join in this. So there was a whole subway car starting to remove the graffiti. But the best part of what happened, and why I should have brought the picture that I couldn't bring, is that if you can picture what a swastika looks like, then take a little bit of the power away from the image by putting lines all around it so that you're basically looking at four boxes if you just rearrange the geometry of it. And in those boxes, they put the letters L-O-V-E, love. They took a symbol of hate and turned it into love. It turns out that this uh, case of graffiti hadn't even been reported to the police yet, let's hope that it was new. And people weren't even necessarily believing the stories, but luckily there were pictures, and you can go on the New York Times website and you can see these pictures of swastikas. Just the word, the symbol, the picture brings so much hate to my heart. And to know that others saw that, felt hate, and chose love is certainly the message that I want us to leave the skate park with today. So thank you for spending some time here in the education tent. It's a pleasure to learn with you and be with you.